Welcome, guys. Uh, let's go ahead and begin. Um, we're getting into chapter 14 now, flood control. And I've just handed out uh, your final homework assignment of the semester, homework 12, flood control. Now, on this first problem, it's kind of a detailed uh, procedure that you'll need to solve using Excel. And we're going to have a few examples that I think will help prepare you for that. But there's some additional instruction found online. So um, the, uh, the link is provided on the paper there. And in case you don't want to type that into your browser, uh, the PDF of this is also posted on MU Online. And you can just click on the PDF link, and then that'll take you straight to the video. You'll notice the end of the link says t equals 5662. That's the time in the video. That's actually like a two hour long video, but it's not till the very end that I start talking about this specific problem. So I'd hate for you to have to watch that entire video, but that link will take you right to the relevant part that addresses this homework problem. Uh, the rest of the problems, problem uh, two and three, you can actually get started on problem two or three after today's lecture. I'm not sure how deep into the material we're going to make it today, so I don't know if we'll get into the material that addresses problem one. But um, the other two problems you can get start an early start on. It's relatively straightforward. So uh, let's look at these announcements. So the uh, homework 12 is due on Thursday the 7th, and that's a change from what it says on the course schedule. I think the course schedule indicated that that assignment would be due on Tuesday, but it'll be due on Thursday instead. And so I've changed the submission deadline on MU Online for that. The link will be live until 9.30 a.m. on the 7th. Your next big uh, event after that Homework 12 submission will be our final exam on Tuesday the 12th. We've got to wake up early for that one. The exam's at 8. and. Um, I'm really going to turn the screws on this final exam, guys. So be here on time. You're going to need all the time you can muster for this test. I mean, it's going to be brutal, a sea of red ink. This is absolutely a massacre. So now see, now that I've said that, you'll study so hard that it'll feel like it. You'll just be skipping through a, a meadow full of flowers. It'll feel like it was nothing at all. It's all about expectations in this world. That's the key to happiness is low expectations. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, that cheerful message, let's start talking about flood control. All right. Um, now, we've been talking about storms and the size of storms in terms of their return period. And so by now, you know that a, a five-year storm is one that, on average, is going to have a recurrence every five years. Or another way of thinking about a five-year storm is that in any given year, there's a 20% chance of a storm of that size of occurring. But um, sometimes we move beyond that way of assessing the uh, magnitude of a storm depending on uh, what kind of infrastructure we're trying to protect for. And so there are certain types of uh, structures that are uh, so important or the consequences would be so catastrophic if they failed that we move on beyond the 10-year storm, 100-year storm, 200-year storm scale. And um, in those cases, we would consider something known as the estimated limiting value. And uh, that is the largest possible event that could occur at a given location. And so this figure kind of illustrates that uh, a major structure, maybe like a dam, where there are homes downstream of the dam that would be affected by its, um, by its failure, we would use 100%, maybe down into the 70% range of the ELV. And if you notice what that corresponds to, even just the 70% of ELV is more than a 500-year storm. And now we, we sometimes think that we're providing a lot of protection if we would design a drainage network to, uh, uh, to handle a 100-year storm. And that's the design standard for a lot of interstate freeways, is a 100-year storm. And we think, wow, that's so much protection. But think about the, the risk of a dam failing, 1% um, chance of a dam failing every year. And people just simply wouldn't tolerate that. And so that's why we move on to a much higher standard of protection. And so this table, which comes from your text, kind of illustrates the typical uh, 
um, return period that's used for designing different types of things. For instance, uh, a low traffic airfield where you've got a runway that is going to be submerged for just a few minutes every five to ten years. So they own an air park or the, uh, I don't remember the name of the airfield, right across the river here over in Ohio. There's another one I think called Robert J. Newland Field um, uh, that's closer to Lavalette. Anyways, um, the, the more people are going to be relying on uh, a piece of infrastructure like a high traffic airfield, you'll notice the return period is much higher, 50 to 100 year storm. So the way to achieve protection on something as flat as a runway is to uh, make sure that there's at least enough slope that the sheet flow can get off of the runway or that you've got um, inlets on the side of runways and drainage ditches uh, along the sides to convey the flow away. But in the case of where we've moved on from return period and now are considering estimated limiting value, instead uh, you'll notice that large dams would be designed to 100% of that limiting value. So in your wildest dreams, imagine the worst case scenario storm where you know, the entire depth of the atmosphere of is full with humid air and then suddenly for whatever reason all of that entire depth of the atmosphere begins to precipitate how much rain could you conceivably get uh, from ground level up to the stratosphere over a certain period of time and then what would be the response of the uh, of the ground to that kind of rainfall that's the sort of scale that you start to consider uh, so that you provide adequate protection for large dams Okay, so here's a figure that comes from the text that's kind of interesting in illustrating the cumulative risk of more than one storm at a time. And so <clears throat> let's look at this figure and kind of interpret a few things here. So for a 10-year design life, along the horizontal axis design life, if we expect that we are going to put in a piece of equipment that has a design life of 10 years, if you take that up and intercept the 90% risk curve, so here, this 0 0.90, it's our cumulative risk. Uh, there's a 90% risk of a five-year return period storm or larger occurring during that 10-year design life. Now, that's a little bit counterintuitive because we usually would think of, uh, for instance, just a 50% risk of a 10-year storm during five years. Because remember, a 10-year storm is one in which in each year there's a 10% chance. And so if you've got five years, each of which has a 10% chance, you'd maybe initially think, well, there's just a 50% risk. But here the key thing that we're talking about is five-year storm or larger. And so it's not just the five-year storm that you're at risk in in each individual year. You know, this year, 2017, we have a risk of a two-year storm. We also have the risk of a five-year storm, and a 10-year storm, and a 20, and a 50. And we can integrate all of those risks together. And so what this figure is showing is that over the course of 10 years, there's a 90% probability that we'll see a five-year storm or greater. Um, or a 63% if we take it up to the, uh, the 10 year. So here's the 10 year return period, 10 year design life. We find where does that intersect? It's between the 60% curve and the, let's see here, it's hard to line this up sometimes when you don't have a pencil. About 63% risk of a 10 year storm or larger. And so this first homework problem that I've handed to you what we're going to be doing with that is taking into account not only each storm, but um, the probability in, in between storms of like a two-year storm and a five-year storm. There is some incremental risk in maybe like a three-year storm and a four-year storm and a five-year storm. And so we'll be doing like a numerical integration to find the cumulative probability of certain events happening. All right, so I think most of you have these notes printed out and can probably draw on this figure. So try and follow the pattern that I illustrated with these first two bullet points and answer the question, if we have a 20-year design life, what storm size has only a 5% risk of at least one event? So a 20-year design life, 
5% risk. All right, so if we start with the horizontal axis, 20-year design life, and go straight up, we want to intersect the 5% risk. And then over sideways, it looks like that's pretty close to the 500-year storm. So the way that we would, in, in words, describe that is that there's a 5% risk of the 500-year storm or larger occurring during a 20-year design life. So, um, and think about when you get in an airplane. Some people are nervous about flying, right? I mean, they actually have a physical reaction to the anxiety of, of flying on an airplane. When you get on an airplane, what's the risk of a crash? There are tens of thousands of flights every day, and we go years between fatal uh, air crashes in the United States and so I mean we're talking way way less than 1% risk and so um, consider people are actually nervous about that tiny tiny risk and then what this is saying is that uh, in, in 20 years you've got a 5% risk of a 500 year storm and so uh, it, it's sometimes important to consider what can happen at the extremes because um, a 5% probability is small, but think about all the cities in the United States. You know, there are a lot of metropolitan areas, and even though a 5% risk for any one city is small, one of those cities is going to experience this fat tail risk, and that's a term that's used to describe something that maybe has a low probability but a high impact when it does occur. So, All right. Um, now, you previously have downloaded rainfall data from uh, from a station, I think what we do the Charleston Airport or the Huntington Airport, maybe some other location if you found enough data. And there are a couple of different ways of looking at large, lengthy data sets like that. And this illustration just um, kind of demonstrates the different points of view for ranking rainfall data over 20 years. So this first one is just uh, showing the uh, all of the data, the complete duration. And so that may include, in any given year, there could be uh, a lot of significant storms, and then there may be periods where there's not much at all. Uh, another way of filtering that, the, the one here at the bottom, is illustrating just if you have the largest storm in any year. And so having two big storms together, like look at this one, we don't have any sort of scaling on the horizontal axis, but you notice that they're the largest storm that was seen in this uh, timeline was preceded by one that's pretty big. But we don't see that in the annual maxima because it's just the one largest storm that's being illustrated in the annual maxima. Now in annual exceedance, what we've got is if this is 20 years, they found the 20 largest events. And so the 20 largest events are illustrated regardless of when they occur. And so if you go to the precipitation frequency data server, then there are a couple of different IDF curves that you can have it calculate and display for any given area. And what we've done, the default thing that I've kind of guided you towards, is considering the annual exceedance series. So that would be you know, the, the top storms regardless of when they occur. But the option is there for you to develop an IDF curve that's just based on annual maxima. And so this is kind of an artificial constraint where you're saying that it's just uh, only one storm a year gets to be counted when really the, the way that infrastructure behaves is it doesn't matter if it's a calendar year or if the recent storm was relatively uh, soon prior to another one of interest. and so. The annual exceedance series, if you have statistical data that's developed based on this, it's going to be more accurate. But there are some records 
Like if you go back way, way into the olden days where um, they would only record the biggest storm of the year. Or something that's more realistic is in the case of stream gauge data. Uh, sometimes in a stream gauge, it'll just tell you what's the average flow for the day. Or maybe what's the maximum since they went back and serviced uh, a gauge. And so maybe they would tell you the maximum flow in every year at a stream gauge rather than you know, over the course of 20 years, what was the top 20 events, they might only have the data that's the, uh, the top event in each of the 20 years that's occurred. So just be aware of that uh, distinction between annual exceedance and annual maxima. So there's all of the data, and then depending on how you're filtering it. Okay, so there's a lot of bad things that can happen in this world. There's all sorts of natural disasters, uh, tornadoes, and um, big devastating fires like they had in Northern California. Actually, Northern California has had it kind of tough in the last uh, year. They had floods in the spring, fires in the fall. Who knows, maybe they got a tsunami headed their way. Uh, they have earthquakes in California all the time, so glad we're not living in California for a lot of reasons. We're kind of pretty safe here in the tri-state area. We don't have much seismic activity. Um, I do remember a tornado that briefly came through. Uh, it actually hit um, just uh, west of Milton a couple of years ago. And I went out to the location where the tornado hit. And sure enough, trees were just toppled over. And it, it didn't make it very far because uh, the hills kind of protect us from uh, the tornadoes forming really getting ahead of steam, but um, uh, flooding is, is a really big risk that kind of affects people on more of a micro scale. Um, one of the most famous hurricanes in U.S. history hit uh, Texas back in 1900, and this is an event that actually kind of hits close to home, sort of, for me, because my ancestors used to live in Galveston, Galveston Texas, and they survived this uh, hurricane that killed 8,000 people. And uh, after the whole town was devastated, including their home, they just walked from Texas to California. And they just decided, we're going to make a new life in California. Here's the guy that did it. Just uh, walked away from Galveston and never came back. Um, the, uh, the highest point of Galveston is 8.7 feet above sea level. And there was a storm surge during that hurricane that was 15 feet. And so everything was literally underwater, I guess, except for the tops of houses. And so that's how people survived, was uh, climbing up on structures to uh, kind of wait out the hurricane. And it was a surprise. They didn't know it was coming. Nowadays, we have satellites, or maybe even ships in the Gulf can report on what's going on. And you know, there are centers that keep track of um, where storms are beginning to form. But back then, uh, the, the network of weather reporting wasn't anything like what we have these days, and they reacted to it. This is a picture from 1905 where they put in a really significant seawall to try and protect the coast after that surge had caused so much damage. And so the question is, is a big structure like this justified, or is it a response to political pressure and societal panic? Uh, we have some of those same things in place here in Huntington. Uh, we'll look at pictures of our flood wall in here in Huntington uh, in just a moment. Uh, another flooding event that I actually do remember firsthand is this is a picture of Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, they had some really wet weather in the winter of 1983 to the spring of 1984. Um, it was uh, a heavy winter with lots of snowfall, and then it warmed up quickly. And so all of that uh, snow melt began to flood the creeks, and then it rained on top of that snow melt. And there was so much water in the creek that runs through Salt Lake City, Utah, that what they had to do was they had to have the water run down the middle of Main Street. And they set up um, sandbags, and it was kind of like a spectacle. You'd, everyone would come out, and they'd, you know, Boy Scout troops would come see the water running down Main Street. And um, I remember when they asked for volunteers, this is 83, that's how old I am, guys, as I remember this. Uh, they asked for volunteers to take the day off from work and shovel sand into sandbags so that they could kind of like reinforce this artificial stream that was running down the road. So flooding can occur in even arid places like Salt Lake City, Utah. Of course, we know that West Virginia suffers from, from devastating flooding. We don't have a year pass 
that someone's not losing their home due to flash flooding. Um, this is a picture of when the Mississippi River had uh, a breach of its banks and large areas were uh, flooded. And you can see here that there is a flood wall that has been breached and flooding on both sides of that flood wall. And um, it can also cause damage to crops. And even though it's not as dramatic when you have flooding of agricultural land like this, you know, there isn't the same nightly news footage of people crying as they shovel mud out of their house or, you know, the FEMA tents. Um, damage to agricultural land can cause just as much suffering because it raises food prices. It can decrease the availability of what's in the grocery store. Um, so flooding bad, right? Flooding bad, flooding bad, flooding bad. All right. Flooding still bad, interrupts your ability to move about, you know, um, and this has happened to me. I think I told you that I tried to get home one day over the summer and both, both directions I can approach my house from the north or from the south and there was water coming over the road from both directions and so I literally couldn't get to my house. It didn't last long. An hour or two later the flood water had receded and I could, but um, so flood occurs along rivers, streams, uh, that's often what happens here in West Virginia is the only flat land is close to a creek and so people build close to the road because it's expensive to do earthwork and put your house or your trailer up on the hill and so they'll put their house or their trailer close to the creek because it's cheaper to do that but then unfortunately you're closer to where the water is. Coastal areas like Galveston and um, Florida are prone to flooding and Flooding has become the new, more, new normal in Miami Beach, Florida. Um, there are several times a year, usually coinciding with high tide, you know, depending on the lunar cycle, where the water will just come up out of the storm drains and flood the streets. And it's not that it was raining at all. It can be a perfectly sunny day. It's just that sea level is rising a little bit. And actually, since um, much of Florida is on a, a porous limestone that is prone to sinking a little bit when heavy buildings are built on it. Um, the ground is getting lower and the water is getting higher and so it floods a lot in Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, an alluvial fan is the uh, soil that accumulates at the mouth of a canyon and uh, that's usually a popular place for rich people to build their houses in the foothills of the canyons and so they're up and can look down over the valley. But this alluvial fan is also a risky place because when there's a flash flood, uh, then the water comes out of the canyon right into those expensive homes that are built up on the bench. <coughs> structural measures here. Um, structural measures is going to take on a, a specific technical definition in the context of flood control. And what that means is, when we've done something specific to try and modify the relationship between a storm, how high the water gets, and how much damage occurs for a certain water depth. And so structural doesn't necessarily mean like a building or a bridge. You know, structural in civil engineering, we're talking about forces and loads and deflection. So that's not what structural means here. Here it means a, a human-made modification to a series of relationships that I'm going to demonstrate the graphs in just a minute. But we can do several things to try and protect against flooding. And what this is saying is that, for instance, if you have um, a, uh, a levee that you've built, then uh, that levee can actually increase the risk of flooding in some other locations that aren't within the protection zone. So we'll go over that in just a bit. The floodplain. This is one of the uh, words that's in your list of terminology. And just a quick plug about that, your final exam, just like the midterm did, is going to have several concept questions that will be drawn from the list of terminology I've asked you to become acquainted with. And so the floodplain is that land that's adjoining rivers and it's flat and uh, is prone to flooding. Uh, so this is an illustration that's showing, although the channel most of the time is in a fixed, deep, and fairly uh, predictable location. When the water level rises, there's some flat land adjacent to, to rivers that's the floodplain. And uh, 
the entirety of Huntington is built on a floodplain. And there are, of course, there are homes up in the, the foothills and the Beverly Hills area that, that isn't in the floodplain. But that's why there's a city here is because there's flat land that's at risk of flooding, which is why they had to build the, uh, uh, the flood wall around the town. Uh, so this is illustrating that most of the time the water is in this well-defined channel, but then uh, FEMA does studies to try and delineate what are the extents of the 100-year flood. Uh, because there, there are discounts for flood insurance if you live outside of that 100-year flood extents, and really high premiums that have to be paid if your home is inside of the 100-year flood limits and doesn't have any other kind of protection. Some people will build their houses on stilts or will um, you know, bring in exterior fill to bring the foundation of the home above that 100-year flood limit. And then you can save enough money on insurance rates and on the risk of flooding to make that worthwhile. Here's the alluvial fan that I was mentioning before. You'll see that here is a canyon. And because when there's a flash flood, there's so much scour energy in the fast-moving water, boulders and lots of sediment can be deposited at the mouth of a canyon. And so this alluvial fan um, is a risky spot because any future flooding is going to sort of be discharged over this, in, this same wide area. And it, it's called a fan because of the shape of the fill that is deposited in such an area. Okay, now this is illustrating some technical definitions. Uh, in a floodway, no development is allowed because if you did build in the floodway, then it would raise the water level too much. There's a rule in place that says for the 100-year storm, we shouldn't build any place where if we do, it would raise the water level more than one foot. So you think about the relationship between you know, cross-sectional area you need to have a certain cross-sectional area available to handle the 100-year flow, uh, flow. And if you reduce the width of the channel, then the depth is going to have to go up to have that same cross-sectional area. And so if you see how they've put in some artificial fill on the banks of the stream, and people do this a lot in West Virginia because they're, they're looking for more backyard, or maybe they want to have a better place to park their vehicles. And so there's all sorts of people who will just take whatever they can get, whether it's broken roof tiles or concrete or construction debris or whatever, uh, dump it close to the river to try and build up some additional flat land. Uh, and that's OK as long as it's in the fringe. The fringe is the area that you are allowed to build in. But if you get into this uh, floodway, then any additional um, cross-sectional area loss inside of the floodway will force the water level to come up more than one foot above its natural pre-development elevations. So the floodplain is the entirety of where the water would go naturally during a 100-year storm. If we didn't have any of this extra fill in, then the water would be at its base elevation but we allow for a one-foot increase. And so that's why there's a difference between the floodplain and the floodway, is that one foot of additional depth. Encroachment is any development that increases the flood height and uh, reduces the capacity of a stream to carry water. We've already talked about the difference between the floodway and the fringe. All right, so the principles of floodplain management then is uh, we want to reduce how susceptible um, infrastructure is to flooding. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, the easiest thing we can do is limit development so there's less impervious area. You know, it, it's so much more expensive to jack up an existing building or to put a flood wall around a town than it is to try and manage initially a reduction in the amount of runoff that occurs. And so um, reduce flood susceptibility is the first principle. The second principle, modify the flood, is just to try and uh, reduce how high the water level gets for a certain storm event. And there's several ways to do that um, that we'll talk about how they, how they work. 
And then uh, the last thing you do is just responding to disasters when they occur. Now, here's the problem, is that, um, um, I don't want to be too harsh, but Joe Q Public, you know, is kind of, they're not mm, kind of idiotic, I guess is maybe the best way to put it, you know. Like people uh, have a hard time understanding risk and, uh, and if it's not happening right now, it's easy to ignore. And so um, reducing the susceptibility of flooding, although it's where you get the most bang for your buck, people think, well, flooding's not happening to me right now. Why should I worry about it? And what's a lot more like uh, visually uh, what catches the attention and what pull, tugs at the heartstrings is when someone gets their house flooded, let's give them money so they can rebuild their house. And so you know, political pressure says that assisting and responding to communities that have experienced flooding, that's the most important money you can spend because you're helping people. But actually, you have a really poor return on investment when you do that. And in fact, what people do with a lot of flood relief is they just rebuild in the same way, in the same location that they just got flooded in. And so they're going to have the same problem again in the future. So there's kind of a tension between what the smart money would do, which is prevent flooding, and what the foolish money would do, which is um, respond to flooding. Um, so the flood insurance program is designed to try and break that cycle. And in some ways, it's been effective in getting people to recognize the added cost of living in an area that's at risk of flooding uh, because it has higher rates in higher risk areas. But by law, flood insurance has to be available to everyone in the United States. And so there are some people that they pay high premiums, um, but they may have their house flooded in consecutive years even. Uh, there were several stories on, uh, on the radio recently about homes down in Texas where uh, in the past 10 years they've maybe had four flooding claims and each one of them was for the full value of the house. And so uh, a house that cost someone $200,000 when they bought it 10 years ago has already received like $700,000 in flood insurance payouts because they were paying their premium and so any claim that is, is uh, legitimate has to be honored by the National Flood Insurance Program. And so there are efforts to try and buy up those really repeat at-risk homes that get lots of claims. Um, but so far, the budget for buying out those especially high-risk homes isn't enough to make a dent in, uh, in the problem. Um, so as a part of the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, there is a, a process of requiring permits anytime people want to do development in the 100-year floodplain. And here in Cabell County, there is a, a county agency that is in charge of managing that process where people are supposed to get a permit when they want to develop in the floodplain. Now, in practice, like I said, there are a lot of people who will just dump fill into their backyard to try and increase the flat space they've got available to park cars or you know, plant grass. And I think that a lot of that development doesn't go and get the necessary permits. But anytime some sort of a commercial development is planned where it's just more than maybe a, a rogue homeowner dumping fill into the creek, anything like a business that's going to have a license or have to receive an inspection is supposed to go and get uh, a permit to operate in the floodplain. The other principles that are uh, in place with this National Flood Insurance Program is to try and use flood resistant materials. And so those are things that um, even if they do occasionally get wet, aren't going to rot or spoil. And so building materials that can occasionally uh, be wet or trying to raise the lowest finished floor so that, um, so that the foundation isn't damaged when there is flooding. Um, prohibiting encroachments is the best thing that can be done to ensure that the water le level doesn't get too high because we've already talked about encroachment when you squeeze the river on the sides then it's going to be getting deeper and then that's when the flooding will spill into areas that normally wouldn't experience any kind of excess flows. Okay, these figures are really important and you will have questions on the final exam related to this and two more figures that I'm about to explain. And so uh, this is going to be the relationships between first of all exceedance frequency and discharge. And so think about on the horizontal axis, an in increasing exceedance frequency. You already know that if you have um, a 10-year storm, 
it's going to be a certain amount of discharge, but a 100-year storm is even more discharge. So there's this, it's not always a straight line. In fact, it's never going to be a straight line, but there's some sort of relationship between um, uh, how infrequently a storm occurs and the flow rate. And the way that we can define this curve is with hydrologic analysis, so making a watershed model. You can take your HEC-1 model and put in the 10-year storm and see what the peak flow rate is. Put in the 100-year storm, see what the peak flow rate is. Put in a 500-year storm, see what the peak flow rate is, and make this curve. Okay, the next relationship that's important when you assess the risk of a flood is what flow rate is going to cause which depth. Stage is just another word for depth. And so it's going to have units of feet or meters. Discharge means a volumetric flow rate, so cubic feet per second or cubic meters per second. Now, sometimes people get thrown off here because in the previous figure, we had discharge on the vertical axis, and now we've got it on the horizontal axis. And let me explain it to you this way, is that these figures so far are kind of illustrating the input variable on the horizontal axis and then the dependent variable on the vertical axis. And so we say, if we're interested in a 10-year storm, so we're picking a certain exceedance frequency, then what is the discharge associated with that? And now if we have a certain discharge in mind, then the way that you would know what is the depth of the flow through a stream, you'd have to do a hydraulic analysis. So you remember that at the end of hydraulic engineering last spring, we were talking about the numerical integration method. Um, or if you want to use a, a hydraulic model, uh, there's uh, HECRAS is a commonly used hydraulic model that you build a series of cross sections. You tell this model, um, you know, like what is the width and the depth of the stream channel that's available. And then once you send a flow rate through that model, it'll tell you how deep the water is. So you'd use a hydraulic model to define this curve. So now, what have we defined? We know for a 10-year storm, what will be the flow rate? And then take that flow rate, put it into the hydraulic model, and now you know for the 10-year storm and its corresponding flow, flow rate, how deep the water is going to be. Okay, so far so good. Any questions? Okay, this last one, um, you would take maybe a surveyor and uh, an engineering economist, and you'd assess for a certain area how much water depth is going to cause how much damage. And so again, we've put the input variable on the horizontal axis. So this is our independent variable, the stage, which remember that means depth. And now the dependent variable on the vertical axis is how much damage is experienced. So what we can do with this is we can say, for a five-year storm, how much flood damage is there going to be? Now, it's a couple of steps to get there. The five-year storm, we have to know how much flow rate there's going to be. And for a certain flow rate, we have to know how deep the water's going to be. And then for a certain water depth, we walk around the city and we say, if the water depth is at 1,300 feet, how many of these homes are going to be underwater? And how deeply underwater will they be? Is it going to be the whole structure that's destroyed, or is it just going to be a little water damage on the carpet? Are we going to have to replace the couch, the TV that's hung on the wall? Uh, I mean, there are studies that have looked at residential areas, commercial areas, businesses of different types to find out how much depth is associated with how much damage, and so that we can define this curve of stage versus damage. So in flood control, ultimately what we want to do is we want to redu reduce the dollar cost of damage. So you think about all the things that we try to do to, uh, to save money on flooding, we're trying to adjust these curves. And so on the final exam, the questions that you're going to get is I'm going to ask you, how is this curve different? How are these series of three curves different by different types of structural measures? Remember, a structural measure is some kind of a modification that humans can make in order to reduce the risk of damage occurring. There are also non-structural measures. Um, non-structural measures would just uh, modify damage susceptibility, like um, 
Oh, we'll go into, to, into the definitions of non-structural measures. It, it's usually related to planning and policy or maybe, uh, ironically, raising people's houses up above the, uh, where the water is going to be. The structural measures are trying to reduce the amount of water that gets to the location of interest. The non-structural measures are trying to, for a certain amount of water, reduce the damage or how susceptible the property is that's going to be getting wet. So these can be really expensive. And it's kind of an economic decision to assess whether the money that you save is worth how much you spend to, to do all this work. And remember the uh, time value of money, the idea that a dollar now is more valuable than a dollar in the future. Do you remember why that's the case? Why a dollar in 2017 is more valuable than a dollar in 2027? Inflation. What does it seem from the word? It seems like inflation would mean that the money's more valuable in the future. Isn't that what inflation means? Why does the word inflation mean that money will be less valuable in the future? Okay. Yeah, it's not the value of the dollar that's inflating. It's how much things cost are inflating. And so, since goods are becoming more expensive in the future, then that means the value of each dollar is going to be less. And so what we're doing in all these flood control measures is we're spending today's money to prevent damage in the future. And so, boy, that's really not sexy to Joe Q taxpayer, the idea that you want to take money now to prevent something bad from happening in the future. You know, like we live in an instant gratification society. And so asking anybody to pay for something now for something in the future is not going to look good to them, especially when the benefit in the future is just to reduce the risk of something. Like they're going to say, well, it wasn't even a guaranteed that I was going to get flooded in the future. It was just a maybe that I was going to get flooded. And the thing that you're doing doesn't make it a definite that it won't flood. It's just making it less likely that it's going to flood. I mean, that's awfully abstract for people. And so it's really hard to, uh, I mean, you kind of have to sneak around when you're trying to, uh, to do this. It's important and it can be proven. but People don't like math and science, you know, and they don't like having discipline of paying for things in the future. So, all right. Uh, what I'd suggest you do as we talk through some of these structural measures is think about these three curves and think about how the thing we're talking about is going to make flood damage less expensive. We'll go over, I'll show you the answer to each of these, each of these uh, structural measures in just a moment, but some of them reduce the, uh, the discharge. Some of them will bring the water level down, or some of them will change the relationship between damage and stage. But all right, this flood control reservoir, for instance, this is a, a large scale pond, in essence. You know, ponding, putting in a, a drainage pond is what we would do pretty close to the source of uh, flooding. But a big reservoir like this is, uh, is on an entirely different scale. And it doesn't change uh, the relationship between damage and stage. So in the city itself, we haven't changed um, uh, the height of any buildings. We haven't changed um, like the relationship between the river and the city. And we haven't adjusted the relationship between stage and discharge. But discharge and exceedance frequency has been changed. And so the uh, the before is in the solid line here, and the after is the dashed line. And so by storing some of the water in a gigantic pond or you know, a flood control reservoir, what we're saying is for a, site, a certain size storm, so if we go up, let's say that this represents the 100-year storm. In the 100-year storm, the water that's going through the stream, the flow rate is lower than it otherwise would have been because we're taking some of the water that would have been in the river and we're temporarily storing it in this gigantic pond. And so this dashed line is saying that it's lower than it initially would have been. Now why is it above the original line in the low flow rates? I struggle to, to think what they're trying to indicate by that because what that says is that actually you'd have more discharge for the, uh, for the low flow rates than initially. 
And I think probably what that means is just that um, they must have, uh, by bringing all the water to a central location, disturbed some of the, the natural storage in the channel beforehand because uh, you know, before the water actually starts filling up this reservoir, it can make its way through this path more quickly than it did when it was maybe just like a meandering stream. Because before they put this big uh, reservoir in, it was a river that was probably going through this, winding its way through the same location. And so by flattening it out and turning it into like a smooth surface, the water can get more quickly between point A and point B than maybe it did before that was there. But at, when the water levels get high, then, you know, uh, then this storage becomes an impediment to the, the quick moving flow that otherwise would have been flooding. So that's what a reservoir does. It only changes the exceedance frequency versus discharge figure. Now these questions are going to come on the first part of your exam, which is concept questions. And so um, you know, I encourage you to, to memorize these and maybe make notes if that will help you to learn how these different structural measures work. But you won't just be able to copy off of an equation sheet what these different changes are. So that's flood control reservoirs. Um, reservoirs are best when the, uh, the protection you're trying to provide is spread out over a large area. And the reason I say that is that what we're trying to do here is concentrate where the water is. And, and so this is good for agricultural land where uh, it would be hard to put a flood wall around a really large agricultural area. Flood walls really only work when there's a concentration of value. And so a flood wall, in contrast, to this is what's valuable is on the inside of the flood wall being kept dry. Here, you're keeping the water inside the barrier so that the protection is outside the barrier. And so you've got a lot of land that's being protected by bringing all the water to a central location there. Um, so a reservoir is best for when what you're protecting is spread out. And if you want a high degree of protection, uh, you know, this is providing protection for agricultural or for other types of property as well. And then the water, if it makes the most economic sense if then you can do something else with the water that's impounded. And so that may be hydropower, if it's at an elevation that allows you to sort of harness some of the energy that's there, or uh, if you could draw it off more slowly for irrigation. That was a, uh, a primary motivator when I would go in the UAE to these flood control locations is that sometimes they did direct draw from those reservoirs to irrigate agricultural areas or uh, sometimes they had those um, flood control impoundments just to try and promote infiltration to recharge the groundwater. So if you have some other use for it, then it makes more economic sense. Um, you can only do it though in areas where land is available and so if it's fully built out and developed, then a reservoir is going to be really challenging because there just wouldn't be the public appetite for imminent domain and ripping down someone's house to put in a giant empty area that's only going to fill up once every few years for a couple of days. Um, in the end, you have to do an analysis to find out if construction costs can be justified. And so the value of protection has to outweigh the cost of providing that protection. Okay, now a diversion, what a diversion does is it kind of draws water away from a river once the water level gets to a certain area. It's, it's like a bypass. And so a, a diversion says that when the water level gets to a certain extent, when there's a certain amount of flow, then this new curve, you'll notice that it's completely flat. And so that's saying that we're going to have the same discharge going through a river regardless of whether it's a 25-year storm or a 50-year storm. But then once you exceed the capacity of the bypass, then the water level, the discharge amount, starts to increase again. So a diversion just draws the flood away from damage centers. And so it would be similar to if the strategy for this would be
if we dredged another river that was running parallel to the Ohio River, and we said, ah, oh, Proctorville's not that great. Let's just have a, uh, let's dredge our, a secondary river parallel to the Ohio River, and then when the water level gets to a certain height, it just floods Proctorville, and it keeps Huntington safe. All right? So that's the example of a diversion. Now, they wouldn't actually flood some other town to do that. A diversion is built where you've got the land where you're selecting where you want the flooding to occur. And, and so you're saying, here's our high value location. We've got all this empty land someplace else. Let's try and be strategic about where the flooding occurs. And so then where we care about the water levels, you know, the, the section of the stream that actually is causing damage that we're concerned with, it has this change to the relationship between exceedance frequency and discharge. So here was the before discharge, and here's the after. It doesn't affect the relationship between flow rate and depth. It doesn't affect the relationship between how much damage there is for a certain depth. It's just um, for a certain exceedance frequency what the flow rate is through the stretch that we're interested in because we're just sending all that extra water someplace else. Again, this kind of uh, diversion structural measure is best when uh, what you're trying to protect is spread out. And if you want a lot of protection, it's going to be very expensive, but it provides a high degree of protection. Uh, and similar to the case of uh, an impoundment like a, a big flood control reservoir, you need to have the land available for it. Another kind of diversion, remember we saw that video of what they do in Japan, that big underground vault where they have those jet turbine engines to try and pump the water out. And so since they didn't have the land available at the surface in Japan, then they're tunneling out to uh, provide um, a diversion when they have excess water. And as always, it's only suitable if the value of what's being protected is greater than the construction costs. Levees and flood walls are both similar in the way that they work. And this is a picture of a levee in the Netherlands. And actually, recently, I've been watching a TV series where the whole plot of this TV series is what if the levees in the Netherlands broke? You know, there's a big storm. So it's actually a TV series. It's all about hydrology. It's, you know, it's a great premise. Um, but um, the way that this works is it modifies all three of the relationships, but actually not all of them are for the best. It's kind of interesting. It makes things worse in a way. Let's look at that. So first of all, remember the solid line represents the original. And the dashed line is, uh, is the after. And so the first thing that it does, let's, let's start with the exceedance frequency versus discharge. It's worse when you build a levee or a flood wall because you're going to have, for a certain exceedance frequency, more discharge than you did originally. And the reason why is that <coughs> before this levee was in place, the water would spread out more. It would be moving more slowly as it flooded areas. But what we're doing by building a wall alongside the river is you're increasing the peak flow. And so there's a less wetted perimeter compared to the cross-sectional area. So the water velocities are higher. And so the discharges are actually going to be greater. The water moves more quickly through a levee than it would if the flooding had occurred. So that's a negative. That's not what we want to happen. But what it does do is for a, a certain discharge, the damage to stage relationship is going to be much more favorable. So think about, in this case, in the middle graph here, it's saying for a certain discharge, the water depth is higher, which again is the opposite of what we really want. If originally the water levels wouldn't get as high because the water would spread out during the flooding. But here in the damage versus stage curve, all of the water is staying on the left side of this wall rather than getting in contact with the homes that are on the right side of the wall. So you know, the value property is being protected when the water level is getting higher. So stage originally, what would happen is for a certain water depth, we'd have damage. 
but now we have to get to a much higher water depth before there's any damage. Let me ask you this though, so think critically here. This horizontal line, what does the meaning of that where suddenly what we're saying is the water level gets to a certain height and then all of this damage occurs. What do you think is the physical meaning of that horizontal line? Yeah, the levee broke. And so suddenly you're experiencing, instead of gradual damage, where if we didn't have the levee there to begin with, you know, a little bit of overflow is going to affect some of the houses that are especially low-lying. And then as the water level gets higher and higher, there's more damage. Uh, in this case, all of that damage occurs in, uh, pretty much instantaneously. They're saying there's a little bit of failure that where it's just starting to spill over the top but then the levee breaks and fails completely and all of the flooding uh, that would have occurred anyways happens. But it happens at a later depth than it originally was going to. So here's our flood wall here in Huntington. Uh, Harris Water, is it Harris Waterfront Park? Is that the name of it? No. So here's a photo of it actually protecting against flooding. Just one time have I, since I've lived in Huntington, have they sealed up the flood walls and the water was kind of submerging the park. Um, channel modifications is uh, another way to change the relationship between exceedance frequency and damage. And you can see here it's uh, dredging. What they're doing is they're trying to increase the depth of the stream to provide more capacity and it may be m multiple reasons that you'd want to do that. If you dredge the channel then it makes it better for um, barges and boats to be able to navigate up the river, but also provides more capacity for water storage. Um, they've done a lot of channel modifications in Florida and there are these canals that have been used to convey water out to the sea so that the agricultural land is more productive and less prone to flooding. Uh, channel modifications have also been uh, done throughout the Netherlands. You know, the Netherlands is kind of a, an interesting case study in land that's been reclaimed. Um, and uh, so the way that the channel modifications work is there's no change to the relationship between damage and water depth, but in the case of exceedance frequency, when you're improving the capacity of the channel to convey flow, you're making things worse. This curve being higher means that for a certain exceedance frequency, the discharge is faster. So a storm moves more quickly through the channel if you've dredged it and you've made the channel more hydraulically efficient. But the benefit is that for a certain discharge, the depth isn't as high. So if we've scooped out the sediment from the bottom of the channel, then the water level isn't going to get as tall as it originally would have for the same flow rate. So that's the adjustment, is just trying to keep the water levels lower than they otherwise would have been, even if there is more flow rate going through the stream. Okay, so those have all been examples of various structural measures, but the way that flood proofing or non-structural measures work is they don't change specifically the relationship between exceedance frequency and discharge. And we can think of this relationship between exceedance frequency and discharge, remember, this is what we assess with a hydrologic model. And the discharge versus stage is what we assess with a hydraulic model. But then this relationship between damage and stage is more of an economic question. And so here, if we're waterproofing walls or raising buildings in place or having flood warning to try and do something as simple as just allowing people to move their cars when the water level is going to arise, it's al always kind of a surprise when um, you see cars that were underwater and you think, well, why didn't the drivers just go somewhere else? Or why did they not park in a low-lying area? And it could be that it was in the middle of the night that this storm came through. And so if you have some sort of a, an alarm system that can wake people up so they can drive their car to higher ground, then that's going to reduce the amount of damage that occurs. And so this curve, what it's saying is for a certain height, you have less damage. And so let's say the water depth is 10 feet. So before, the solid line said that we'd have 
a million dollars worth of damage for 10 feet water depths, but now with the modification it's only half a million dollars worth of damage for a certain water depth. Okay, um, in the homework, one of the uh, questions I ask you to do is to look at the floodplain maps that FEMA makes available. And we're going to click on that in just a moment. But the, uh, the first link is where you can get precipitation data that is real time. Uh, you already have experience downloading precipitation data that's historical, you know, for a certain stream gauge wanting to go back over time and getting all of the data that's available for that, uh, for that particular um, historical gauge. But what this is showing is what's the weather like at all of these locations in the U.S. And you can pick a spot and find out the real time. Let's see if we click here. The Little Kanawha River. Oh, wait, it's popping up for just a second. All right, so you can see, oh, okay, here it is. The water depth at the uh, south side bridge of the Kanawha River. So it looks like we've got pretty stable conditions here, stage versus time. Um, now these water depths are partly a function of whether it's been wet in the watersheds upstream, but also since, um, since there are the locks and dams on the Ohio River, the Army Corps of Engineers, as, as you already know since you visited, they have the ability to adjust the pool level uh, by simply controlling how much water makes its way through the locks and dams. And so, um, you know, the water levels will go up when it's wet weather, but it's also a function of how they're managing uh, those locations. All right, let's look at this floodplain mapping because I want to show you how to make something called a firm, F-E-R-M. So let's put in an address, um, Milton, West Virginia. Milton, all right. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, has everybody here been out by the fairgrounds? Or you know where Blanco Glass is? Maybe if you grew up in the area, you went on field trips to Blanco Glass as a kid. Um, what I'd like to do is let's download an image of the floodplain map in the, in the area of Milton. Uh, you can download the entirety of the floodplain map. I think since this is a zip, we'll probably have to unzip that. Let's see if we can get what's on the insides there. We'll extract it. Okay, so it's a TIFF file, which is a, an uncompressed image file, and it also, in that folder, was a .tfw. You'll notice that's a really small file, and that's a world file that what it does is it uh, provides the geographic coordinates of the map so that if you were going to be opening up that image in some sort of GIS software, it would open it up in a location that's consistent with its coordinates. And so you could layer this map on top of other uh, type of mapping. So if we zoom in, then what you can see is the different flood zones. And um, here it gives you definitions of what these different zones mean. So zone A is they don't know what the base flood elevations are. Zone AO, the flood depths would get from one to three feet during the 100-year storm, and so on. So you can see that uh, there are certain places where if you are close to the stream, this is zone AE is close to where the mud river flows through. So this would be more prone to flooding than zone X. This zone X is um, where someone has gone to the trouble of uh, having a surveyor come out to their house and say that they're at a lower risk of flooding there so they can get a break on their uh, flood insurance or maybe at the requirement of their mortgage company. But, you know, here it's kind of interesting. This is 
a residential area and the people who lived on the north side of 2nd Street are not going to have flooding during the 100 year storm, but on the south side of that 2nd Street is going to be more pl prone to flooding. And so you can look right at the street level of you know, who's at risk for flooding and who's at less risk. Um, all right, so that's one way of looking at it is to download the entire area, the entire um, map, but there are also these, uh, what are called firms, and let's see, did I click on the right link to get, let me just do a quick Google search here. This is where we just were. Now, I got one of these firms yesterday. The what? Probably. I can't imagine that they would have a redundant flood mapping system. See, what you need to do for the homework assignment is something called a firm, and they've changed their website since I was on here in the spring. Web map? Uh, no, and that's not it. view slash print. Maybe it's this view slash print. Yes, this is what we need here. All right. So how did I get that? View slash print? Yes. All right. So for the homework, when you get to the Map Service Center, view slash print will allow you to prepare an interactive uh, firm. And so what you do is, um, let's zoom in on an area here. I think this is Huntington, close to campus. And you can choose, um, if we make a firm that is kind of like a little printable map that you would use as like proof of where your house is. And so you, know, you could zoom in on an area of interest, like if, if your house was in this zone, and you include the scale map and the uh, kind of details about what location it is. You can create a PDF file of any area of interest and then it will show like which zone you're in. Here's the map scale and it's saying the map number and so if you printed this off it would be kind of a way of taking this into the to the bank or whoever is financing a house and proving to them that the property that you want to buy is in a certain flood mapping zone and this is mostly one so there's not a lot there that's interesting but um, gives you the idea anyway. I ask you, I've selected a, a set of locations in Milton, this 4 Pine Haven Drive and 1044 Heck Street and so on. Um, I ask you to determine the, the, um, like the classification for those locations because those are three different classifications. And so going through this um, FEMA website, you'll be able to figure out what's the status of each of those addresses, kind of doing an investigation using the web. All right, um, so when flooding occurs, we've talked about how when water comes in contact with structures, it's going to cause damage that needs to be prepared. That's direct damage. But when flooding occurs, there's also indirect damage that is like lost business revenue or the expense of rerouting traffic around flooded areas or um, people being less willing to build in locations that are prone to flooding. Um, secondary damage goes even beyond that, and it, it could be um, tourist dollars that are lost. For instance, when there was all that flooding um, near the Greenbrier, there were you know, people's vacations were interrupted, and so the local economy suffered a secondary effect because of the flooding that occurred. And then intangible damage is the types of things that are disadvantages of flooding that's hard to put a dollar cost on. It's just maybe a reduction in the quality of life or the uh, 
the smell of rotting mud uh, close to homes or a reduction in the aesthetic value of a community that suffered from flooding. Um, and then uncertainty damage is where the threat of flooding or maybe uh, an uncertainty about policy or how flood rates could change in the future maybe causes people not to invest in the same way that they would have in a location that wasn't prone to flooding. Uh, so here's a picture down in um, um, Louisiana of a community that's just got obviously a lot of cleaning up to do after some flooding and there's a, a big reduction in the aesthetic value of living in a neighborhood that's covered in mud like this. Okay, uh, so on Tuesday of next week, pre please bring your computer. There is a, uh, an Excel template that we're going to work through a couple of examples um, to try and learn how to figure out if something's economically justified. We're going to look at the expense of different kinds of structural measures and the value of the flood protection that they provide and find out what's the uh, like what's the level of protection that provides the best economic balance of cost versus benefit. So if you bring your computer on Tuesday, we'll be able to do those examples and just to revisit the announcements, remember that this homework that I've given you is going to be due on uh, Thursday of next week and then the uh, final exam Tuesday, December 12th at 8 a.m. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you next Tuesday.